and welcome to episode 202 of the Iron Coop Fights Movies. This episode is available on iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, and hosted by SoundCloud. We're going to discuss Falcon and the Winter Soldier episode 3 in full spoilers this episode. Just that. And then we'll be back with another episode for Godzilla vs. Kong. Um, so uh, I thought for this episode, there's actually a lot going on that is kind of yeah. hard to follow. So I was actually going to go through a review from, uh, I think it's from Vulture. and um, But before we go through it piece by piece, why don't you guys give your ratings? Okay, um, I'll go first. So... <clears throat> I'd say I like this episode. I like what's going on for the most part, but there's a lot of, like, this episode feels like it's definitely setting up a lot of stuff. Um, so, you know, if it pans out horribly, maybe it won't be a good episode. But I like Zemo, even though he seems pretty different, I would say, from how he was in Civil War. And I don't necessarily know if he's better, but he's still fine. And overall, this was one of the more engaging episodes. I haven't disliked any of the first three but i would say this was the one where i was most interested like where is this gonna go so yeah a win for me a win okay everett yeah i liked it as well um i I, i'm probably gonna give it a win i was teetering on giving it a draw though because i'm not necessarily on board with how they treated zemo sort of like what emerson was saying he he's a little bit too chummy with them for my taste like last time we saw him he was like really really gung-ho about destroying all concept of superheroes and now, I don't know, maybe he's had some time to reflect in prison, but it doesn't really sit well with me. But for the most part, I, I really did like the episode, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's a... Oh, wait, did you give your rating? Yeah, I gave it a win. A win. Um, for me, it's a hard loss. The term boring as fuck comes to mind. Um, basically, they, they don't really do a whole lot. What they do do is very inconsequential. And... Yeah, I and it basically undoes a lot of Winter Soldier or Civil War, I guess, more Civil War stuff. Like in terms of the impact of the story, it kind of like undermines it um, in pretty much any way that it references the film. So I, I just I didn't care for Sharon Carter and how she behaved. Um, <clears throat> I didn't what they did with Zemo didn't bother me, but like you said, like where he left off was a great arc. So what is he now? They still don't know. Um, so anyway, let's go into this review. I'm going to read the review, and then we can discuss it by by each paragraph. All right. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier reaches the halfway point of its short... Are you texting Emerson? Something went wrong with Emerson? Uh, he must not be here then. I, yeah, he's I gone. He got kicked out. Well, that's fine. I'll just read it. Um, what the hell was it? All right. <laughs> The Falcon and Winter Soldier reaches the halfway point of its short season with an episode that feels largely transitional. It gets the job done in terms of sheer entertainment value, but it really feels like this show is still setting up the players for the bulk of the story it has to tell. Uh, Looks like we lost Emerson for a a little bit of time here. Um, Anyway, so this week brought Emily Van Camp's Sharon Carter, a.k.a. Agent 13, and Daniel Brohl's Zemo back into the narrative while also dropping in a few other familiar faces and names along the way, including Erskine and Io. Ultimately, Sam and Bucky stayed one step ahead of the new Captain America in their efforts to stop the Flag Smashers, going across the world to track down the origin of the new super soldiers and get back together with old friends. As Sharon says, it's one hell of a reunion. So, I mean, I feel like it does have good entertainment value. But in terms of setting up, like, I just got to be honest, like, I feel I feel like I have no faith in their ability to play off the things that they're supposedly setting up. Um, for example, Zemo should hate the superheroes, right? But he's being chummy mm-hmm. with them. So right. is he possibly doing something that suggests is he playing them in some way? Is he about to turn and try to kill all of them? Because if that's, he doesn't, uh, you know. Well, that's what I was expecting, like, every single time something happened in this episode. And they give you, like, two or three good moments where he could have turned and, like, screwed them over. But then he immediately came back and was like, oh, yeah, no, that was all part of the plan. Yeah, I mean, to me, that sounds like they're probably going to do it later. Yeah. Um, 
I hope so. Because if he's just like a bad guy that's like, hey, it was nice working with you guys. But I'm going to go back to mischief like I've earned my freedom or something. No, like, no, that's that really kind of ruins civil war. Think about well, how yeah, much. There's, yeah. so. Well, there's there's two scenarios that may not happen, but I hope don't happen. Scenario one is he's basically like the not a, not angel's advocate, but like he's like too good now. Where at the end he's like, well, I did my part. We got rid of super soldiers. I'm gonna willingly go back to jail. My job is officially over. Or yeah. he's gonna not do that, and he's gonna screw them over, which I hope happens. He has to screw them over, but he has to try to kill them. He doesn't want to go to jail, and he doesn't want to like just get even. He wants to get rid of the superheroes. I mean. He can't just ignore that. What about his family? Remember how he obsessed he was? They really need to keep Civil War in the back of their mind during this. Because you're right. If if they give him that story arc where they just let him go free at the end or he like changes his mind, it completely undoes Civil War. He needs to keep that mindset. He needs to keep his code. They even said it in here that he has a code, which is why they're working with him. Right. So here we go. Power Broker opens with the new, that's the name of the episode, with Mm -hmm. the new Captain America getting a bit more desperate. He's already pulling out the do you know who I am card when he feels disrespected, and that's never a good sign. The short runtime of the series overall makes this feel a little rushed, doesn't it? New Cap went from being happy on Good Morning America last week to kind of flailing this week. Anyway, he knows that they're drawing blanks and that they're going to have to, quote, bet on someone who's got a better hand i think the writer makes a pretty good point he's um he he was on a completely different arc Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the last episode he was like i'm trying to do my best i'm willing to work with you guys and now he's like kind of an asshole and like yeah when when they bust down the door of that place whatever it was and they don't find anything and he's just kind of like hassling them anyway like he's like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna like flip up every table here until we find what we want. But he already knows there's nothing there. So mm-hmm. what are they doing? Um, I don't know if that's supposed to be like commentary. Like, is he supposed to be like the kind of the bad cops that we have in America? Is that, or is it just bad writing? Gotta love technology. We're we're back. We're going through the review. We were talking about how Captain America <clears throat> has his arc here. He he's like he's pretty different than what he was last well- week. Just just before we get into the arc, what uh, the last thing I heard you were like, I gotta say it's pretty, and then it was I, I got cut out. Uh, I hate I did not like this episode at all. You hated it, okay? And yeah. your main reasons, I'm assuming, were you feel like it's like filler. It's boring. It is. It, this review calls it a transi- transitional episode. Um, I think it's pretty fucking boring. I think it undermines Civil War in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm just not happy with that. So we're talking about how this Captain America this week is different from the like he's saying do you know who i am like that's not the same guy well yeah because um, they're trying to set him up to be evil that was one of my complaints yeah you know there's only three more episodes i know so they're like forcing character development yeah so in this next one while sam and bucky are fighting over what to do about zemo he's breaking out of prison it's all a bit too easy this isn't exactly mission impossible but it does get zemo back with falcon and the winter soldier for the bulk of the episode i mean agreed it's it's silly the way he gets out. Well, also the logic leap of like, we need to talk to him. Therefore we break him out. How about I'm going to drop a random note on a guy's table and says, kill him first. And the guy doesn't say who's telling me who's ordering me to do murder <laughs> in a prison. Could it be any of the other prisoners? Cause this is our random note. Mm-hmm. And he immediately is just like, yeah, I'm going to kill this guy immediately. Like, come on. I yeah, know by the way, can one, can one of you explain something to me? So you know that key card he was hiding in the book at the beginning? Did sure. he just did he just have that? The thing that helped him get out. Did he just have that or did Bucky give it to him? I it's implied Bucky gave it to him, but I don't know how that would be. Yeah. Okay, cuz I was going to say if he just had that, why didn't he escape before? He he needed like there was stuff that they did, but still whatever. It's all a little easy, but okay, well, now you got Zemo with him. You only got 6 hours, I suppose. He agrees not to make a move without their approval. But even they can't really believe that's legit. How could they possibly enforce that? You don't make a move unless we tell you. Now, let's go. You without handcuffs. You're going to take us to this place. And if you double cross us in any way, we're going to point guns at you. How could you control that situation? Yeah, he's in control in like two seconds. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you guys gave this a win. I mean, that's pretty stupid. Well, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna defend my giving it a win right now. I <laughs> had an incredibly long day. Sat down to watch it today, uh, and then I was just like, "Wow, this is fun to focus on this rather than something else." So I acknowledge that my opinion may be swayed by everything that happened, but um, I, I just for me it was like, okay, like they're in the city of like Mandrapore or whatever. Like it seems like they're moving to something. I, I don't know. I kind of like turned my brain off completely, to be quite honest. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. So I can't give that a win. I mean, you have to turn your brain off to enjoy it. Yeah, um, I guess I, I'm going to have to retroactively because uh, I, I have like nothing to defend it now that I like think about like why my argument for giving it a win. So I'm going to have to retroactively withdraw my win. I'm not sure I liked anything in this episode. Yeah, that that's the thing. Like usually i would have like oh well i'm gonna back my point up with like but da, 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 da. but i i literally have no possible argument here so which is funny i don't know hmm. they learn that zemo is rich enough to have a garage of classic cars and a private plane that they can take to madripoor to scale a ladder of low lives okay i mean him being rich like cool like i'm indifferent to it they're starting with a mid-level fence named selby can I just say right now, this whole sequence doesn't have to exist. Um, well, also, the city is weird in general. Like, it, it felt very, like, like what is this, you know? Like, it felt like, like cyberpunk. They went to cyberpunk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Like, how do they have a city that advanced and massive that's, like, lawless? There's an interesting chat on the plane about how quickly leadership can turn to chaos in which Zemo basically draws a line from Hitler to Red Skull to Captain America. Okay, that's got to be some foreshadowing. When people are put on pedestals, their flaws are forgotten, and that leads to problems. In a sense, Falcon and the Winter Soldier is about the people behind the folks on the pedestal. They may not get the spotlight, but they're almost as important when it comes to keeping the world safe or the opposite. Cut to Latvia, where Carly Morgenthau is hiding out and saying goodbye to someone important named Donya Madani. I assume that's a Persian name. It's a brief scene meant to humanize Carly a bit in that she's fighting for the people often left behind by the heroes of the world. Yeah, but then they undermine it at well, the end of the episode completely. We don't know shit about her, and, and I don't know shit about Donya. So, like, she's sick, and I get I get she's, like, some type of freedom fighter. Whatever. I mean, I don't know. Off to Madripoor, where, all the, guy, where the guys are all dressed up. Sam is even taking an alias, a smooth-dressed... N- a smooth dresser named Conrad Mack, a.k.a. the Smiling Tiger. On their way to Lowtown, they're escorted to an underground club of surly faces and com- complicated drinks. A thug for the power broker makes it clear that Zemo isn't welcome, but the Winter Soldier serves as his protection, kicking the ass of some bar toughs in a poorly choreographed bar fight. Yeah, there's really no way to defend I mean, that. I hear people like, oh my god, they reused the Winter Soldier theme. Wow. It's like, yeah, I mean, that was like a nice reference. It's not like that that was new, but it was a nice reference. At least it was consistent with Winter Soldier behavior. The scene is also like kind of hilarious. <laughs> well, something about it is stupid. You you know what's meant to be played off as like, this is badass. Well, it's like, like Bucky because like, you like... Bucky's trying to be the Winter Soldier. I think that's what makes it funny is that he puts on like that serious face and then he's just beating up guys in a bar as everyone just watches. And then they all take out guns but don't do anything. Yeah. They meet with a nefarious Selby. Wow, this person's probably going to be a big deal. And get a name that matters. Dr. Wilfred Nagel. (laughs) Okay. I mean, already you kind of like, come on, where are we going with this? Is Power Broker, Selby, now Nagel? How many people are involved in this thing that I need to care about? How many of these people are, in my mind, like I'm thinking like writing-wise, how many of these people mean nothing? So already two out of three mean nothing. (laughs) Um, I mean, not yet, but in this episode, by the end of this episode, two out of three of those names mean nothing. And the smiling tiger gets a call from his sister, Sarah. He can't turn off his phone. I don't get why. Why does he have to answer? I don't know. Well, they like, told it him makes to, it seem like she's Yeah, but it makes it seem like she's suspicious where there, like, there was no indication that she didn't trust him beforehand. Do they, um, 
Does do you guys have like ringers like like loud ringers on your phone? I so I I set um ringers for certain people whose calls I can't miss, but 99% of the time my phone's on silent anyway. So I don't so even get those when they call unless those, I purposely. Okay, yeah. So if they call those I and my phone's on silent, it's just silent. Unless I've turned my phone to loud mode. Like sometimes on yeah. weekends when I'm waiting for a call from like someone who I need to like get the call and after I'll have my phone on me, I'll turn it You got away. super robotic, Emerson. Yeah. But anyway, my point was like the only people I know who have like like regularly audible ringtones is uh it's like old people. Like, I don't know anyone my age or your age that is like, hey, are you guys both there? Yeah. You're there. Okay, yeah. we lost Emerson. Um, is there anyone – do you know anyone your age that keeps it on loud? I mean, uh, I sometimes keep it on loud. I had a feeling like, but you only, would, uh, yeah. Well, I only do it when I have to rem- – uh, when I have – if I'm like expecting a phone call. Otherwise, it's off, like what Emerson said. Uh, I only have one real ringer, and that's, I think, for Ian. Other than that, it's just on vibrate. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a weird, like, come on, this, his phone rings, and then, it, like, he can't just be like, it's my sister. Like, I, I'm not going to take it right now. Like, that, that's, I mean, he's telling the truth, they're supposed to be lying, but that's also, like, a lie that's not a big, or a truth that's not suspicious. Like, you got a call from your sister? Like, is he not allowed to have siblings? Like, You know the easy fix to this problem? When they're walking down the street in those goofy outfits, and Zemo tells them, you have to stick to character no matter what, or they will kill you. How about instead you just leave your phone in the plane or in the car so it doesn't bother you and there's no chance of it going off? If you can think that it might happen, chances are it will happen. Immediately I mean, fixes the problem. Wouldn't they, like, pat them down maybe? Yeah. Be like, like yeah. They, Well, I mean, it's a bar and it's a lawless city. I'm assuming I mean, but before they meet Selby, like, hey, you have a phone. We're going to confiscate everything until you come out of your meeting. I don't know. Anyways, that would, yeah, that would make Makes sense. Smiling Tiger tries to play tough on his phone with Sarah, but then his sister calls him Sam and things get intense. A shot bursts through a window and a bounty comes out for for Selby's killers instantly. Who shot Selby and how did a bounty go out so quickly? They're already on the run, framed her for her death. I mean, that's some pretty sloppy shit there. Um but yeah, he, that was like he, some weird John Wick stuff. Like she immediately dies, and yeah, she had like a computer chip like it monitoring into her John pulse. Wick. It turned into John Wick. I mean, that's a, I literally said that out loud. I'm like, is this John Wick now? Like to Jade, um, Everett, you gave this a win though. I gave it a win because it was um it was sort of situational. I watched this like the minute it came out, like at midnight, and I was basically watching it on the generic. Uh, consumer level like i enjoyed washington watching it it was entertaining at that level but now that we're talking about it i can actually like start talking about the flaws that it had yeah i mean so far it's been pretty bad um i mean you're right but that doesn't mean like i, I still had fun watching it it's just a really not really that great they run right into sharon carter who has been off the grid since madripoor or in madripoor since the action of civil war don't forget, she stole Cap Shield and helped them track down Zemo. So she's on the run, although she's barely hiding in a nice place in Hightown. Didn't you think that was weird? Yeah, it's a little convenient how, like, an episode ago they were talking about her, like, yeah, she's on the run, lawless. Uh, and then two episodes later, oh, look, out of all the places on Earth, here she is. Just so I got this straight, place we go. she was like a, a mid level and possibly lower level agent in Shield. Yeah. On a government salary. Uh-huh. And now she's living in like a luxurious place in a in, in a town that's like it seems like it's with people with a lot of money and then like a lot of poor people, but they're in their own side of the town, so you don't have to deal with the poor people. It's only rich people, and she's got a nice big apartment in a expensive city. If I'm remembering correctly, she was a Shield agent, and then Shield collapsed, and she became like an Interpol agent or something. But then you go from that; she's like an a high-end art dealer in this place because remember they go through the art and they're like all the place all the ones in the louvre are fake yeah. these are the real ones like yeah so i'm i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that this whole thing has worked out quite well for her <laughs> she should yeah. maybe just do the art um how did sharon know they were in town uh you know what i really don't have an answer but it feels like a question that the show may not answer beyond the fact that she's clearly a little powerful in madripoor She's gotten kind of awful now, as Bucky notes. 
You know the whole hero thing is a joke, she asks two heroes. It's kind of a quick turn for Sharon since the last time we saw her, but a lot has happened in the MCU since Civil War. They offer to clear her name if she helps them. I mean, I understand if like it's it's post snap and you're like, yeah, fuck the heroes. <laughs> like, what's the point? But then when the heroes literally bring you back to life. I mean, to sit there and be like, fuck the heroes. Wait a minute, did they ever specify whether or not she got snapped? I don't know. I mean, either way, it's like the heroes saved the world. Uh, like, yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, come on. You're going to say fuck the heroes? Anyway, so so far, anything pre-Sharon is pretty bad, and now that she's here, it's you know arguably worse. Um, so she does; she agrees to help them almost immediately. The plotting here sometimes feels incredibly rushed, as our two heroes are about to have what feels like a fun night on the town in Madripoor, but Sharon jumps in to say they found Nagel. <laughs> Isn't that yes. kind of funny? What, how they're like bouncing around in that really weird nightclub arena or whatever the hell they were standing in? Well, no, I'm, then, I'm uh, talking about the pacing of it. She immediately just comes up to them? I'm talking about the pacing of it. Well, like, yeah, no, I, I know. She why, just immediately pops in and is like, hey, yeah, I found this guy. Why not just like, I mean, I know it's because of filler, but why don't you just contact Sharon and be like, hey, do you have a lead on this power broker person? And she's like, yeah, I know a guy named Nagel. The whole thing with Selby just cut. It doesn't, you don't need any of it. So far. Yeah, I guess anyway. that's true. But they needed they needed a way to make it more action-packed. Yeah, apparently. They track him to a shipyard. There are always shipyards. You know what? They don't need a way. I, I actually don't agree with that. Why don't you just make it five episodes then? Like, you don't have to do it this way. Anyway, they track him to a shipyard. There are always shipyards. And find a hidden lab where Nagel is jamming to some Mel Torme. I don't know what that is. There's some monologuing, and Nagel reveals that he is the one who rebuilt the super serum. He made 20 vials. There could be a lot of super soldiers. As all the... I mean, I didn't mind this, especially the dynamic that he got snapped. Mm -hmm. But I was unclear. So did he make the vials and then get snapped? And then when he came back, they were gone? I think what they said was he got, he got hired by the U.S. government to start his research. Then he got snapped, and then when he came back... They had abandoned the project, so he took his research and he went to Nadrapur instead, and that's where he made the formula. See, I feel like it would make more sense if he had made the serum, like, right around when he got snapped, and maybe the girl stole it and somehow finished it. Or, like, or maybe it was finished. Like, something like that, where it was about to be, it was basically done, and then he got snapped. Instead, it's like, I made the vials, then I got snapped. Then I came back, and then I just like took the serum and went somewhere else. Like I don't know, whatever. Um, as all the bounty hunters in town descend on the location, and Sharon fights off most of them. By the way, like the fighting here was okay, but at, at a certain point, how many people is she fighting? Like fifteen. Yeah, but it wasn't even. Fi- it was. It was a, a serious amount of time. They actually had a giant fight scene cut to like a bunch of exposition and then cut back to her later in the episode and she's still fighting out there. I mean, and some of it's like absurd, like the one where she blocks the guy's punch and then pulls the knife out of his belt (laughs) and stabs him. I mean, it's like, whoa, this is this is actually incredible. Like she should be her story should be told (laughs) in like history books. Who's ever fought that many guys one by one? They're all armed. I mean, that's insane. She's not even yeah. a super soldier. She could be the it's next Black power Widow. Moment. She might. She might as well be the next Black Widow. Like, because it's apparently she has superpowers, which already makes her better. Like, she would have murdered Black Widow, wouldn't she? Uh, Based on what we saw, she could destroy Black Widow. Black Widow had all her flips, but yeah, she was kicking ass in this part. Black Widow was like swinging from people's heads by wrapping her legs around them. Yeah. That's not practical. But but what uh, what's her name was doing? She was like knocking people out. <laughs> like she could have a career in boxing. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, as all the bounty hunters, blah blah blah, she fights off most of them. Zemo shoots the doc because I assume he's creating super soldiers. That's consistent. And then things get really intense. Well, 
Okay. It turns out one of the bad guys brought a rocket launcher. I mean, this is just all over the place. Zemo escapes, puts on his cool mask, and gets villainous, but it's kind of a fake out. He returns to Sam, Sharon, and Bucky, but she can't leave Madripoor. Now, was that his car that he found? Because he had a bunch of classic so. cars. So he just found another classic car and hot wired it? I mean, yes. I, yeah. I really don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, Sharon can't leave Madripoor. Is that it for Sharon? Probably not because she has a big problem, which she mentions to someone after her old friends leave. Is she working with the power broker? I, I got to be honest. Like I feel like it could go either way, and I also don't care. <laughs> so like I really I, I was kind of hoping I'm like oh maybe maybe she, this is it for her maybe we won't see her anymore because this was not a nice like reunion um, the episode ends with a quartet of quick hits Walker and Hoskins are getting frustrated as they stay one step behind the real action of the world Bucky is going to take the shield from the new cap himself I mean, yeah, they're just like saying things. They're just like throwing weird ideas out there. Carly is going to the next level, killing people to accomplish her goals and stay ahead of the power broker. Like she's a full-on terrorist now. So everything that they were saying to humanize her, it's like, no. Is worthless. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, Bucky breaks off from Zemo and Sam in Latvia, following a trail that leads him to Io. I'm here for Zemo. Who's Io? I don't know what that is. She's one of the Dora Milaje. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, did you guys think they had a thing together? Uh, I got that vibe. I think they're going to have like a, like, hey, why didn't you call <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> okay. I mean, you never know. He was in there. He was in, in Wakanda for a while. Yeah. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a pitch here. And, you know, I hope this isn't considered racist. But I don't think that the main character of the show should have been Falcon. I know. Lock me up. (laughs) I know. Um, But this show would have been way more interesting from the new Captain America's point. And, in fact, if you were going to do the whole he turns evil thing, you could have had a lot more time to do it. And it would have been cool with him, like, instead of giving him uh, Hoskins, give him Sam. And it's like, and Sam's like, they're like, they basically gave him, you know, the black sidekick role. And Sam's like, what the hell, you know? Um, and on top of that, you need to reckon with Wakanda. They want Zemo too. And you could bring Bucky, assuming Bucky went back there. And you could explore that a little bit. But I think the dynamics of being the new Captain America, apart from the whole, we're trying to get the bad guys. Like, just the pressure. I think that's way more interesting. And um, I, I guess there's a version of it where you could make Sam the new Captain America um, and have the same sort of ideas. But I kind of like that Sam can't do it. And I think it's cool if you, if you can kill the Captain America and then make Sam the Captain America. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Um, if you could, like, you know, just put him in the show. And kind of as a fake out, like make it a, like even the fans would be like, there's a new Captain America. Why isn't it Sam? <laughs> um, I mean, you, well, you could have if you wanted to, but instead they want to do the buddy cop thing. Um, here are some Easter eggs. Not so much an Easter egg as a supporting character. The woman in the final scene is Io. Uh, she's been in all the Black Panther appearances. She's a Dora Milaje. Uh, blah blah blah. All right. Madripoor has been a location in the Marvel Universe for years, first appearing in New Mutants back in 1985. It was more closely ex- associated with the X Universe than the Avengers. It's located just to the south of Singapore and is more of a small island nation in the books than a bustling metropolis in the show, although it does have a high town and a low town in the source too. Interesting trivia Captain America once teamed up with Wolverine there in World War II, marking the first time chronologically that they ever met. The broker okay. that the boys go to meet in Madripoor is named Selby, which likely makes her a variation on the Marvel Comics character with the same name who first appeared back in 1996. Male in the books, he was a member of the Mutant Liberation Front who could interact with computers and decrypt download files. When they were handing out mutant powers, he got one of the lame ones. <laughs> um, yeah, I, Emerson, when you were gone, I was saying that they could have just cut that whole sequence out of the show. I agree. 
I agree. Mm-hmm. The Smiling Tiger isn't just made up. Uh, isn't just a made up player either. It's a reference to a character first appearing in New Warriors in 1992. Conrad Mack had claws on his fingers and toes, like Wolverine, and was mute. He was part of a group of superhumans in Vietnam called Folding Circle and often battled the New Warriors before landing in Madripoor. There's no evidence he was a snappy dresser as he is on the show. Isn't he like Bronze Tiger or something? That's someone else. Like and I'm not even sure that's Marvel. Is that DC? I think it's DC, but like they, that sounds exactly like him. Yeah. Dr. Wilfred Nagel, the mastermind behind the new super serums, is not a new name to hardcore Marvel fans. Um... The name actually appeared in 2003's Truth, Red, White, and Black, and it's revealed that Nagel was a scientist working for Project Rebirth, the same one that created Captain America. He picked up the work of Dr. Erskine and recreated the super soldier serum to be used on black test subjects, including Isaiah Bradley. So this guy's aged a bit different. Nagel references Dr. Erskine, which is a Stanley Tucci's character, the man who created Cap. So, you know... That's it. I wanna, I wanna ask you guys' opinion on something. Uh-huh. So it's fairly obvious by the end of this show, Falcon's gonna get the shield and John Walker's gonna disappear somehow. Do you guys think is it he's gonna get locked up or like imprisoned, or do you think he's gonna die? I think he's just gonna be evil. I think he's gonna be evil. Yeah, I, I couldn't say. I think he could die. I don't see why they couldn't kill him. Um, but be, remember when I thought that the action figure looked like black and red? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, other people ha- are saying that there is a black and red like merchandise out there. There is black and red. So I guess that wasn't my eyes. Maybe there is something there. So I I mean, in three episodes, he's going to turn into Hydra? Whatever. So anyway, that's it for this episode. We'll be back with our uh, weekly episode. Two minutes. Thank you for listening to the Iron Coop Fights Movies. Please be sure to subscribe and review so that we can spread the show around. You can reach us at theironcoop at gmail.com. Join us for another edition of the Iron Coop Fights Movies.